Everything has to be seen out of the perspective of, um, of how money is developing in our societies or, or globally, in fact. Um, then we will be looking at the digital assets, uh, where, where they come from, what made them possible, um, which direct, you know, what, what the assets are they are, because uh, it's, a, it's a very broad, you will see it's a very broad topic in itself. And then we'll talk about uh, the question about banking or non-banking. You know, uh, up to now, most of the uh, financial financial services have been provided by banks, uh, and now there is a whole range of services being provided by entities which are not banks. And uh, we'll quickly dive into that and see what that means. After that, we'll be looking at new perspectives and new challenges for the banks themselves. So we're looking looking at that uh, from a bank perspective um, and in the end we'll try to attempt at, a, at an outlook uh, basically look at what comes and what can what we can expect from the future uh, on on you know short level or short short term midterm and long term uh, let's see okay and then in the end we'll have some time for q a obviously uh, if you have any questions i would suggest that you just type them into the chat uh, we'll pick them up and we will uh, address them at the end of this presentation. So now to the history of money. You know, you probably you know most of it already, right? Uh, at the very beginning, like very beginning, like 10,000 years ago, um, there is a barter system. So pe people were basically exchanging goods, right? Uh, af af uh, after a while, um, they realized that it's much more pra practical to have some item of value which was typically go typically gold and to start exchanging that basically giving a certain value to the goods in in um in gold and and helping uh and helping to to have a more efficient way of exchanging uh, after that uh the Bretton wood system came in so basically there were paper money coming out which were basically uh contracts to own gold so each each dollar was worth a certain amount of gold it was basically a help to it was easier to carry around pieces of paper than than bricks of gold or gold coins and that was that but after 71 this connection between gold and paper money was was broken up uh, and that's the money we know now. So uh, the money that is being printed to, uh, today by the central banks is not coupled to gold anymore. It's basically coupled to the to a security or to the value of of the country itself, of the you know value produced by the country itself. Since 2009, though, there is a new development started, um, and so, which are those which start, they started with Bitcoin as a first digital currency. Um, then it, the development continued with second generation digital currencies around 2019. That was Ethereum is the, the one, one of the more, more important, one of the largest one, ones. Um, it's actually the second largest um, cryptocurrency by capitalization currently. Uh, and then there were also discussions or discussions right now, certain countries or many countries are thinking about issuing a central bank digital currency. So basically currencies that are still controlled by the central bank, like, like our fiat money is, but that would be uh, built on, upon the technology which lies, uh, which sets the ground for cryptocurrencies. So that's roughly the de uh, development today. And uh, so all those different type of currencies are um, exist in parallel. And uh, as you can see, it's quite a complex question, not only for um, not only for people who want to, want to invest and, and who are dealing with those, but it's also complex for the regulators because for some currencies they have in, for some currencies they have a control uh, of, over them, for instance, up around the fiat currencies, obviously, and around the new central bank currencies those will be on the control of the regulators but the cryptocurrencies are not on the control of the regulators which puts them um, in front of very new challenges but first before we dig into that a little bit deeper let's have a look at what made cryptocurrencies possible in the first place 
So there is two, two main developments that made cryptocurrencies possible. First of all, cryptography. So basically the ways to, uh, um, to in encrypt information. Um, as you, of, of course, this kind of setup where a cryptocurrency is on the chain is on in, is basically out in the internet for everybody to see. Uh, you need strong encryption in order to make sure that um, that the processes you want to build into this currency are robust and cannot be hacked. Basically, so that's uh, the cryptocurrency, especially this um, this asymmetric uh, crypt uh, cryptography with a uh, sender uh, where a sender has two keys, a private key. Which is yours? That that's basically the key you keep, and that gives you access to your wallet where you have your cryptocurrencies. And then the, there is a public key which allows other people to send you money or to you to send money to other people. And this setup is uh, lies at the basis of uh, of the uh, any corporate cryptocurrency uh, like Bitcoin, for instance, or Ethereum. The only thing is that uh, that allows this development is the uh, basically distributed ledger uh, technology. You can See it this way. In the traditional bank, the bank itself keeps all records of your accounts. So the bank knows how much you have on your account, what you pay in, what you take out, where you transfer money, and so on. This is not the case anymore for the cryptocurrencies. This information about <clears throat> what is on your account and what happens on your account, what are, what are the transactions in your account, is distributed in the whole chain. That's why it's called distributed ledger. And so it's not depending on a, on a certain central, um, on a central house anymore, on a central ledger anymore, uh, who will be dealing with all of that. It's, um, it's, this is depending on a, a consensus of all those people who have part of this ledger or who have this ledger and who are checking or making sure that this ledger is correct. And that's how basically the, um, cryptocurrency is working or the, the blockchain technology is working. So if you are the person A at the very bottom on the left, if you are a person A and want to change a block, uh, something to the blockchain, for instance, you want to buy some, some Bitcoin, then um, you create a new block where this change is entered. This block is then distributed to the, the whole network of those people who are um, within this, this cryptocurrency network. Within those network, this network, this block or this, this transaction on the block is then approved. It has to be approved by a number of, of participants, either all of them or mo most of them, which is uh, the case for, for Bitcoin or a certain group of participants, which is the case of Ethereum, for instance. And only after those transactions have been approved, they are added to the distributed ledger and therefore they are basically valid in the chain. Yeah, I see there is already first comments, but I'll be looking at that later on. Okay, so that's roughly what, how, how what the technology is behind uh, cryptocurrencies or uh, digital assets in general. Uh, and then let's have a look at them. Um, you know, may, everybody's talking about Bitcoin. Everybody's talking about Ethereum. Some people are talking about NFTs. You have you've probably heard of that, but there is a very broad range of different uh, digital assets already. Um, there's digital assets, which are basically digital currencies, uh, which, uh, you know, Bitcoin will be a typical uh, type of those. There is digital assets, which are infrastructure, which provide parts of an infrastructure. So for instance, smart contracts. Um, so smart contracts are basically digital contracts, which are also on the chain. Ethereum is one of those uh, technologies which provides the capabilities to do that. We'll have a quick look at that later on. Then there is uh, digital assets which are which provide applications. So you can basically problem you can um, program applications not based on some uh, on the infrastructure of a big provider like a Google or a Amazon or a Microsoft. But you can pro program applications based on distributed networks in um, in the internet, and that's something which is also very new. And um, you know, also uh, quickly that that's basically uh, what you uh, when you uh, hear about Web three zero, 
that's basically reflecting this type of applications. Um, and then there is um, on-chain derivatives. That's a little bit more uh, difficult. Um, there are, for instance, digital assets that, that try to re reflect the value of other assets. There is, for instance, uh, different different assets that reflect the value of the US dollars, uh, of the US dollar. And uh, so you can deal with digital assets and they have a mechanism behind them to make sure that a one token of this asset is always worth one one dollar. This is, for instance, this one. And within those categories, there is a whole range of, of different applications, different assets there, and so on and so forth. So you have... Um, um, so you see, it's it's a very diverse and a, and a huge in, uh, universe of of assets, and which is strange looking at that. The, the fact that it is so so diverse is that all the digital assets are currently but through the markets or are currently very seen as basically the same as Bitcoin. When you look at the value of those assets on the internet, you will see that. Um, they all go up when the Bitcoin goes up. They all go down when the Bitcoins go down. The Bitcoin goes down. So they don't really make the difference between those. But uh, let's uh, we will have a quick deep dive in two types of assets that you might have heard of and um, that are most interesting for, for all of us. Uh, one will be Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, as one, but that's uh, in the next step. And another one will be the tokenization of, as uh, of assets. So basically token reflecting um, reflecting uh, certain values, certain goods. It can, The ones that you will have heard of are NFTs probably, but there is much more than that. And that's what we'll be having a look at right now. Um, so again, you know, there is uh, regarding tokenization, um, you will have heard of of a non-fungible token, that's NFTs, right? Um, that's on one hand, this is that those little pictures where, you know, the, these little apes, for instance, bought apes, where people are paying a huge amount of money for, for, for those. And, but you can tokenize uh, all the assets as well. Uh, there is, the, um, you can tokenize, for instance, some, oops, some collectibles, uh, like, uh, like football cards. You can tokenize all the collectibles like records. Uh, and so on. What is important for non-fungible token, and that's what actually the meaning of non-fungible is, that they are not, you cannot ex uh, exchange, they are unique. Each fungible, non-fungible token is unique to itself. Um, so you can have two different apes, NFTs, but those two different apes are different and you cannot exchange them one-to-one. -one. Uh, they, they, um, yeah, they are unique, as I said before, right? Um, and the, you have usually they are usually traded on on certain platforms like uh, OpenSea, for instance, which are non-regulated. There is very few regulated, actually non -reg no regulated platforms yet for for the trading of uh, this kind of digital assets. On the other hand, you have the fungible assets, and the fungible assets uh, are um, are basically uh, you buy with these assets you buy a piece of a of a certain good. And they are inter interchangeable. So, for instance, the the bank I worked before um, um, has tokenized a Picasso. A Picasso picture painting, which is valued at about five million Swiss francs, has been tokenized. So, one thousand token have been issued uh, for for this painting. Each paint each token is worth five thousand, right? And those are fungible, meaning those are inter in interchangeable. So one token of this uh, of this pool of 1,000 tokens is exactly the same as another one. So it basically tells you that if you own two tokens of those Picasso, you 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 uh, own a share of 10,000 francs or a share of one 500 of uh, of this picture. And you can tokenize a lot of things this way. You can tokenize uh, you know art, like for instance the Picasso itself. You can also tokenize uh, a wine collection has been tokenized based on uh, on this technology. A car collection has been tokenized already. Uh, you could even tokenize all, all the goods like properties um, and and other uh, and many others. And um, well, what is this kind of token? It's basically a smart contract telling or a contract in on the chain which defines that you own a certain fraction of the good. What makes it difficult with the, what are the benefits of, of this kind of tokenization? First of all, it frees capital. So let's see you have such a painting worth 5 million hanging on, on your wall, right? 
Uh, and but you'd like to use some money to I don't know buy other shares, to diversify, to buy another painting or something like this. Uh, how and you know you up to now your options were to basically go to an auction and to sell the painting. Uh, with the tokenization, you could tokenize the painting and sell, let's say, ten percent of the uh, of the token, which will give you a liquid assets of half a million uh, Swiss francs. Those you can invest. And you still have a good portion of the rights of the token. And those who buy this kind of token, usually that they, you know, many investors are, don't have enough funds to buy a Picasso, right? And if you and if you be, if, even if you believe that the or the art market is a good investment, but if but you could buy a token or the, or let's say ten token of um, uh, of a Picasso, like this, investing fifty thousand francs into into the art market into a Picasso and and then profit of any gain in value over the time. Um, so again, uh, freeze capital simplifies change of ownership. So it, you, know, you can not only easily trans transfer the ownership of a, of, a, uh, of a value to someone else, but also a portion of this value to someone else, uh, which gives you an access to a, a large uh, investor group. So if you want to sell a Picasso, you, you're not only looking at people who can invest 5 million, but you can also looking at, be looking at people who can invest 5,000, which opens up to a new segment of potential buyers. And it uh, provides a certain valuation. If the, this token are on a certain exchange and there is a certain trading around those tokens, then basically this exchange sets the value of the of the um, of the asset. Before that, the value was typically set during an auction, which happens every couple of years, but not regularly, uh, as it can happen with tokenization. On the other hand, there is a lot of challenges around that. As you can see, there is, um, you know, it, there is a lot of legal questions to be answered. Who is keeping or holding such an asset? So where does it hang? You know, if if you have ninety percent of the token and ten percent, you sell ten percent. You can probably put in a clause which says that whoever owns the majority of the token is allowed to hang this this picture in on your wall. But if you sell out eighty percent of the token, where is it? Who is holding it? Who is making sure that the um, the painting is actually still there and that it is in in a good condition? How is it insured? Um, what are the uh, permitted type of types of use for 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 instance for a um, painting? Are you allowed to um, lend it to a gallery, for instance, or for a car car collection? Are you allowed to drive around with those cars from time to time, or do they have to stay in a museum? Then when can the asset be sold? Usually those people, you know, you could, uh, those currently those ups, uh, currently those token are still limited to a certain time. So for instance, the Picasso, uh, for the Picasso, the the, the token will be transferred, tran will the, the tokens will be sold again in about 10 years, if I'm not wrong. And the the winnings will be distributed to the owners of the token. Uh, you could or make a token that are open end, but very often that's not the case. And especially, for instance, if someone comes in and says, "Wow, I really like this picture. I would like to buy it for double the actual price," there should be some possibility within this framework to sell it at at an earlier stage, if there is an interesting, a good uh, profit, for instance, for the investors. And all of that has to be somehow put into the legal framework. So you can see that the technical. Um, there is, of course, some technical effort to uh, to set up a framework to be able to tokenize uh, assets, but the most of the effort is coming into the legal framework that that has to be built around such a tokenization. Um, one different, the one challenge is that there is currently no open regulated exchanges for tokens. So uh, typically, those uh, those tokens are being traded within the infrastructure of the bank that tokenizes them. And that limits, of course, the reach of uh, for potential clients. This is something which uh, this is something which has to be, uh, you know, which will be corrected hopefully in the future. Okay, that was roughly about that about the, the tokenization of assets. You know, th that's two examples of how, what can be tokenized. There will there is a much broader, um, you know, family of of potential. Um, tokenization ap approaches, potential tokenization uses. As I said before, you could tokenize, for instance, 
uh, your house, your properties, which will easily allow you to, for instance, transfer the ownership of the property from one person to another and so on. So um, here, it's difficult to say what, um, what the future will bring. In fact, um, a couple of years ago, many people thought that tokenization of assets, so the fungible, fungible tokens we see here, will be the big driver of, of uh, digital assets. In the end, it was non-fungible ones with uh, bought apes and all the NFTs, which were uh, the, the booming within within this area for a couple of years. But that might change, and and some new new uses might come up, and uh, you know uh, that only only the future will show. Now let's have a look at cryptocurrencies again. You know, as remember, we saw that cryptocurrencies are currently all correlating with Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is going up, everything is going up. Bitcoin is going down, all the currencies are going down. Uh, which is actually pretty strange because when you look at cryptocurrencies, when you compare, for instance, a Bitcoin to Ethereum, they are completely different, um, completely different structures, completely different uses. Uh, a Bitcoin is basically a digital currency. It's, uh, is a, is, it's like gold, something which is meant to keep your value. On the other hand, Ethereum is a platform for, for decentralized applications, for decentralized, uh, for, for smart contracts and so on. It's basically a technology providing or allowing you to build up business models on top of this technology. So it costs something completely different. Um, then the supply itself of Bitcoin is limited by to 21 million. So um, the, the, the Bitcoins are still being produced and mined, but the mining is getting more and more com complex and more and more expensive the closer you get to this from 21 million. And it will never be, uh, you know, you'll never have more than 21 million Bitcoins. On the other hand, Ethereum doesn't have this kind of uh, maximum. Ethereum is still being produced, but there's also uh, systems within the network, which they call it burn, which take out Ethereum out of the network, which destroy Ethereum's uh, Ethereum um, within the network to making sure that the, that the, the Ethereum volume in itself is not growing too fast. So you see completely different approaches here and there. And then what you can see is um, oh, the, the central finance, you know, as, as I mentioned before, Ethereum can be used to build applications, the decentralized finance applications. So basically finance applications within the, our decentralized network. So within on, on the chain, you can say, uh, Bitcoin is not made for that. And so you see there's the, those two are completely different. And the reason why they are still color correlating, so when one is going up, the other is going up as well, is not because they have the same uh, basic values behind them, it's basically because people don't understand them. So many players in the financial industry, even professional players, still don't have the know-how to make a, a clear dif differentiation between the different dif uh, digital assets. And that's why they see them all as basically the same. But this is expected to be changing in the next couple of years. So again, uh, looking at that, when you compare here uh, the yellow curve, which is some standards and pools, so basically the financial markets, standards and pools 500, uh, with the Bitcoin price, you see that they correlate. So the Bitcoin itself is also seen currently as basically a, a asset like anyone, uh, any uh, any other, but a basically risky one. So if uh, if the markets move up, moves up, the Bitcoin typically moves up with a certain, uh, even stronger than the market itself and the other way around down there. So this correlation is here. Although um, those who have issued the or invented the Bitcoin in the first place, and and the Bitcoin community is saying that the Bitcoin should be looked at more as a, as the gold is looked at, basically something which is deep, uh, disconnected from from the financial markets and is more like a um, storage of value, something like gold, where you can basically self self haven for value, especially in case of um, in case of inflation. So, uh, but again, it's not it's not really visible um, regard when you look at the current development on the Bitcoin in in the markets. But this is this might be changing right now, and that's something which is very interesting because it's something which which only started a couple of weeks ago. Actually, you saw that um, the again the the upper curve there is you know you see quite some volatility, but the upper curve basically. 
shows the development of the Standard & Poor's 500 in the last one month. And you see that it started more or less at the same level where it is now. So you have a more or less a flat development there. On the other hand, when you look at the Bitcoin, it went up. You see a clear uh, upwards uh, development. So for the first time, uh, maybe also because of the pressure of, of, um, of inflation that, that the markets feel currently, you start to see that the Bitcoin shows some signs of being a, a value where people... Uh, that people use to hedge uh, against deflation, to to um, secure themselves against deflation, and that's that, that that's happening for the first time right now. And uh, if this development con continues, it might actually lead to what the Bitcoin community is um, preaching since years and years: that the Bitcoin is um, kind of a safe value against the, the depreciation of money. And but that's something that obviously only. Um, the future will show, but first signs are there that people start to see Bitcoin in a different way, start to better understand the the, tech and the, the background of the Bitcoin as they did before. Okay, besides the you know what we discussed before, technology and um, and the market perception on the different digital assets, um, we have to have a quick look at regulation uh, because that's also something uh, which are which is driving the, the developments of the digital assets worldwide in a very strong way. So when you look at the world, you see that the regulation that basically every country is currently regulating Bitcoin or, or digital assets in a different way, which is understandable because the countries all have uh, a history of um, all have a history of of regulating their own local currencies in a different way or their own lo local economy of a different way um, and now the big challenge comes in because suddenly you have certain currencies which are not bound to a country which are basically global and uh, so the countries have to react to that on in a certain way right so basically well, what are the big challenges with the entrance of digital assets first of all you have to classify them we saw that there is a lot of different classes of digital assets some which are close to the, to the asset classes that the countries already know, like securities or currencies and so on, but some that are completely new. And uh, Ethereum, which is basically a technological platform, is not a class that has been um, have been looked at and understood by the regula regulators before. Um, then there is uh, the, the, you know, the, the risk of overregulation. Every country has a first... You know, the, the, the first move of every country would be to basically make a ban on what they don't know and, and try to limit uh, their use so that they can start to learn and adapt to that. But it's if the countries who would do that would um, take the risk of fall behind in the developments, because, you know, if, if uh, so, they don't want to, the countries are afraid of blocking the, the, those new developments that are happening in worldwide around the, uh, these new technologies. Um, so they, they have to be wary of not not to overregulate those uh, different uh, those different new developments and digital assets themselves. But then uh, there is the question of decentralization, which is new. Uh, before, when something has been, let's say, when shares are issued or bonds are issued, now those traditional the financial assets, there's always a company who is issuing them. Uh, there is a bank who is issuing them. So there is always one counterparty that the regulators can talk with regarding the asset itself. It's not the case anymore with digital assets. They are somewhere in the internet on a chain. There is no central um, central respons responsible party for those assets anymore, which, which makes them, again, very difficult to, um, to regulate and to put into some, some legal framework. And in the end, by what I mentioned before, the jurisdiction divide diversity, those assets are global. Uh, those assets, everybody with an internet access can access those assets, can access those new digital um, services and so on. Uh, so you cannot you cannot start, you know, regulating them in within a country won't help you because, uh, because again, uh, if every country has to start now to kind of align or, or in the end, we have to find some um, global framework of rules for, for these assets, uh, since they are global in nature themselves. So what are the main developments regarding regulation currently? 
Uh, on the, let, let's look at three uh, major, well, two two major regions and Switzerland um, to see what's what's happening there. Right, um, the U.S. is actually pretty um, conservative currently. Um, they are rather on the you know you could you could say that they are rather trying to um, um, slow down the developments in the digital assets currently rather than uh, being proactive and 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 allowing them to grow. Um, one reason for that is that, um, well, the banking sector is, is the financial sector is very, very strong in the US and, um, and the banking sector is slow to adapt to that themselves. So they are not, they don't have a lot of interest in, in pushing those new developments too quickly into the market, endangering their, their own business models. Uh, so here currently in the US, what they, what they basically do say is that those crypto assets, which are, which are similar to assets that they already know, like securities, will be will fall onto the same laws as the original securities laws. And for all the others, there is not there is no substantial or no, no regulation at all currently, you can say. In the EU, there, there have been some regulations, but up to now, every EU country has regulated. Uh, their assets themselves. So, so every country has different rules around the assets. They were slightly similar, but still there was differences between each country. What is coming now, and that's a big change in uh, in, reg in the regulation of digital assets, is that it is expected to mid-24 that the EU will issue uh, a new um, EU-wide uh, regulation for digital assets, the so-called MICA regulation. Um, you can think about that. Maybe you remember uh, when the EU issued the GDPR regulation, uh, which was a EU regulation. But since every every company uh, giving services to EU citizens have had to um, apply to this regulation or to comply with this regulation, this regulation it in the end um, was adopted by basically uh, globally the, the whole, whole world all major um, major markets um, it is very much expected that it could happen also with mika so it could be that uh, after this regulation comes into force and after all uh, companies providing services to eu would have to comply with this regulation that this regulation as well will start to have a global reach and this is again something which might strengthen the, the European market for for the crypto and digital assets. So that that will be very interesting to to look at. Uh, what's happening in Switzerland? Um, Switzerland was one of the first countries to bring in some cl clarifications around digital assets, allowing some very interesting developments, like for instance the two first digital banks, like two first banks for digital assets that, that were founded in Zurich uh, and in Zug, actually. Uh, so the Switzerland was always very, uh, very early on with and, and very pragmatic on, on uh, regulating this kind of um, this kind of assets, which in the end helped to to build up what is called as the, uh, you know, um, the, the, or the, the developments that are right now in Zug. Uh, where you, where Zug is one of the main, uh, actually one of the main places uh, globally in, in the development of uh, services around digital assets, was helped very much by by a very prog progressive and a very uh, very early Swiss um, approach to that. Um, Switzerland, when EU issues a regulation, very often Switzerland follows the regulation of the EU after a certain time with some adaptations. So I would very much expect that uh, after uh, EU will have issued Mika around the end of 2024, 2025, Switzerland will issue a regulation themselves, which will be very close to the Mika regulation. Okay. Um, so when talking about regulations, we also have to talking about the banking systems in, in general, right? Uh, because right now, uh, before, most of the um, banking services were provided by banks. Uh, and that's changing more and more. Um, you have more and more uh, financial services provided by non-banking uh, non -banking entities. Uh, like, for instance, uh, crypto exchanges are broadly non-regulated and, and not provided by banks. Uh, so what are the differences? You know, well, let's say you have money to invest and you don't know if you rather invest it with a 
with a regular bank in crypto or rather invest it with some uh, some exchange, uh, some crypto exchange, for instance. Well, there is a lot of differences, but uh, what you can see is basically that uh, the regulated banks try to fit the, their services within the current banking setup. Uh, so you could say, for instance, that um, like as a typical bank, they are not very often they are not very uh, developed regarding their uh, let's say that their digitization. So it's so it's much more difficult to open an account with a bank than with a with a regulated uh, with a non-regulated player, for instance, with a, a um, crypto exchange. On the other hand, once you are in the bank itself, um, the services are pretty uh, pretty simple and and pretty straightforward. Um, on the other hand, when you are uh, when you are uh, working on an, on in a non-regulated area, the services you know, you have many different service providers. You have to you understand uh, how to deal with with blockchain, how to how to how to open a wallet. There is a lot of questions around that. It, it's all pretty complex still, and that's by the way one reason why um, the investments in in cryptocurrencies are not growing faster is there is still quite some high hurdles for uh, non tech savvy. Uh, investors to actually make a first step into the into this world. When you look at security, um, here again, the technical security is reasonably good within the banks. Uh, on chain, when you look when you deal with with non regulated players, it very much depends. If you have your if you have your Bitcoin on the chain itself, then you can expect them to be pretty secure uh, because the chains are very robust. Wait, but when you're dealing with, let's say, with an exchange, it might very well be that the exchange itself or its other third-party service it might very well be that this third party is not as robust and secure as it is. That's why, for instance, you heard about the FTX exchange that, that went bankrupt because uh, it was not it was technically not, not transparent, also out of, from the business model perspective, not very transparent on how they are working in the first place. So here again, you have to understand quite a lot around what you do before you start investing and, and doing that on a secure way. When you look at the financial security, the banks will give the normal um, counterparty protection or the regulatory deposit protection, uh, like in Switzerland. In a bank, you have 100,000 francs that are secured by the state, which also applies to the, uh, to the digital assets that you have at, at the bank. On the other hand, you have no protection at all, obviously, uh, when you're looking at the non-regulated one. Um, I won't be going into much detail because we have um, 15 minutes left, roughly, and we'd like to leave some time for um, some time for questions in the end. So let's have a look at the banks themselves. Uh, why don't banks go into the crypto market more quick, quickly than, than they do now? Um, so when you look at how a normal bank is built up, right, you have a core banking system, so basically the technology on which the bank is built. Then you have the different supporting functions like compliance, legal risk management, which provides services within the bank itself, like, for instance, uh, set, putting together a risk management framework within the bank, but also providing services to your clients. Uh, the clients won't, won't get won't also get some some risk advice, some compliance advice, and so on. And then you have the services of the bank uh, that could, that can be custody, trading services, advisory services, asset management, passive income, lending, for instance, and so on. And then obviously you have the management of the bank themselves. So I hope we won't get overwhelmed with next uh, next slide because it shows you where the differences come in or where what 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 impact um, digital assets have on a bank. So let's start with the bank management. The bank management is not used usually to, to the new business models around, around the digital assets. So have, it's it as, new to the, as much new to them as it's new to you. So they have to understand that first and uh, have to understand the risks and they have, have to um, shape the strategy of the bank around them, uh, which is quite an effort already um, as a first step, as an entry. Then when you look at the yellow boxes, which are the services, um, the, the users of uh, digital assets very often expect a different kind of banking than the traditional banking clients. Um, the users expect, because they know that from, from the non-banking providers, they expect a 24-hour service, they expect 
uh, everything uh, you know um, everything being mobile everything being uh, real time and so on and that has to be built into the banking infrastructure which which is already quite a stretch to a traditional banking infrastructure on on the advisory part for instance you have to have quite a lot of know-how to actually be able to advise your clients around digital assets and very very little banks have that so that's again a, quite a hurdle because you know the, the banks don't want to go out with new products to which they don't understand enough themselves and where client, their clients might lose money and where they don't cannot give any any good advice high quality advice around them and so on so that you, you see a lot of uh, difficulties there when you look at other services around digital assets like tokenization that we talked before right that's completely new services and bank don't have the capabilities to do that from the technical side from the legal compliance side or from risk management side and so on so this is something a completely new business model that the bank would have to build up within the infrastructure and within the organization which makes it very costly and very complex to 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 do and uh you know we talked about compliance legal risk management they have to understand those new uh, models and those new assets themselves as well and when even if you have a look quick look at the very core of the technology that the bank is built up upon the core banking systems and so on they have to accommodate those new assets so if you have a uh, let's say an account in this bank and not only in swiss francs and euros but also now, now in bitcoin somehow they have to have those bitcoin on their books and they have to provide the the, the right reporting for you the the right um, you know, uh, all, all everything that the bank has to has to be do, uh, doing uh, for you for around your, um, you know, to provide services to you, and uh, so you have to build that up in, inside. And the core banking systems, the traditional system within a bank, are not basically not built to do that. So this is this has to be built uh, completely new very often uh, within the banking infrastructure. Okay, so as a very last topic now. Uh, we looked at all the different developments and our, all the, the challenges that, that we have see for, for the different players, for the consumers, but also for the banks within, um, within this area. And have a look, let's have a look now at, um, at the future. And uh, let's have an attempt at, at, an, at an outlook to where we are going within this uh, new development. So, and again, that's not a advice and, and we're all looking at a crystal ball here. Uh, but we we can see already certain developments. For instance, on the short term, we see, as I said before, that um, the Bitcoin might start to be something like an inflation protection to a certain part. So um, we can expect that um, the digital assets will will start to be to be recognized as what they have been built for, and not just being looked at as risky assets and not, nothing more. Um, then. The better understanding of digital token has a lot to do with the advisory um, advisory services that I talked before. So basically, um, banks will start to understand the different um, different cryptocurrencies, different uh, digital assets better, uh, and start to differentiate with, between those, which will also uh, lead to a more differentiated development in the markets of those different assets. So when a Bitcoin goes up, it doesn't mean that the Ethereum also has to go up. Depending on the um, you know the, the uh, what happens around the Bitcoin or what happens around in Ethereum, for instance, uh, and then what we also already see now is that banks starts to provide some first basic um, services around digital assets, which are currently provided by third parties very often. So they are the, the banks are cooperating with third parties so that they don't have to bear all the technical uh, complexity of this kind of service. Um, but but they are making a first step into this area because the clients are expecting from them to provide this kind of services from them. On the midterm, you can expect that um, that the access to the decentral the central finance services will, will start to improve, the, the UX, so basically the user experience will start to improve, which will allow more people to, to make a first step into the decentral finance services. Um, Banks will and, and all financial players, in fact, will start to uh, understand digital assets even better. We start to build models around digital assets. Uh, we start to prefer professionalize around digital assets, um, and which will 
allow again the banks to get even deeper into into this field and to provide better services for the clients in, the, in this field which will lead in the end to the digital asset functionality to be built into the core banking system so the bank will integrate digital assets much better than they do today within the infrastructure uh, those providing much more services and better services to the clients so in future you might you know you might have much more choice uh, regarding what you want to get as a service from a bank uh, regarding digital assets and then we expect some digital expense uh, digital asset exchanges to to appear which will allow you to trade on those exchanges with each assets. So as I said before, currently those exchanges are usually limited to, a, to within the infrastructure of a bank. Uh, but in, in the future, you will be able to go far. Um, you know, you reach far more people uh, with this kind of services or this kind of assets. And then on the long term, if you really look at a crystal ball here, we can expect the wet. What is been talked about uh, or called Web 3.0, you might have heard about that, uh, which will start to reach main, mainstream. And what Web 3.0 means is basically that the services that are provided in the internet won't be coming from like big players like a Facebook and Amazon, uh, uh, Ali, Alibaba or whatever. They will be provided. They will be provided by um, by networks within uh, within the internet, or basically they will be decentralized and finance services will be part of it so we could expect that this move into the the decentralized services away from from the from the big players providing services will continue uh, on the long term and uh, might even take over on the long term uh, compared with today um which which might also lead to a good part of the um, of the economic growth being moved into this de decentralized structures uh, that will, you know, that will have to be seen. But already now, there is companies that are not organized by, uh, like in a like in a traditional organization, but are completely decentralized with their workers working all over the world, with no, um, you know, like management structure as we have seen to see today. There is already some. So we are already slowly moving in this direction, which is very much in line with the developments around digital assets themselves, because they are very often built also on the same technologies there. Uh, the banks, uh, today you have a clear differentiation between banks and the decentralized final financial services systems. This differentiation will start to, to di disappear on the long term, we can expect. So banks will be a part of a network of, of decentralized financial services, of an ecosystem of uh, decentralized uh, financial services. And you as a uh, customer will basically pick yourself those services you need and, and uh, customize for yourself the services that you need for, uh, for your means. Then the new business models will emerge, which is of course expected. Uh, you know, as I said before, um, nobody really expected the NFTs to to grow as a huge business model in the last couple of years. It happened. Uh, there will be very new ones coming up. It's here. It's almost impossible to say which one might come. Maybe tokenization of uh, larger assets might be one of those. But again, uh, future only will tell um, what it will be. And uh, as very last. Point here, customers speak less about money and more about assets, values, and services. Because for you as a as a customer, money is not so important. Is what you get from money is important. Uh, is what is the service you get, the experience you get that is important. So I think that um, in, in the future there will be less and less focus on who is providing a service and money as a, as an intermediary for the service. It will be more and more the service itself that will be. Um, in the spotlight and, and in in the you know basically important for yourself and it's not it won't be as important anymore what happens in between to provide this service so the banking will start to disappear from your perspective it will all help happen automatically in the background okay so um that was quite an outlook uh i hope you enjoyed the presentation. I know it's quite a lot, and I know there is a lot of different topics around that, not uh, not all easy ones. So let's have a look at uh, anyone chatted anything. We will get a copy of these slides uh, 
Yeah, well, if you want to, I can send those slides to you. Sure. I will see how to do that. I think I should have um, I should have the, um, uh, your email information since uh, you registered on Eventbrite. So yes, I'll be able to send you the copy. Um, Sanjay saying, what is your price target for Bitcoin in 12 months? Well, that's very interesting, right? Um, if, again, it's not the investment advice, but uh, if it's if it's true that um, Bitcoin will start to be seen not as a risky asset, but as a, a secure alternative to, to money investments or to share investments, then there could be a, de a development which will be similar to gold, uh, which will basically mean that the more inflation there is, um the more uh, the more value flows into those assets which are resistant to inflation which might be the bitcoin how how far it will get how far up it will get it's difficult to say it was at 64000 at some point we are at 60 no at 28 around 28 right now uh, i i couldn't tell you if it will reach the all time high again by 12 months but uh, there is just there is people who think that that might be the case and once they're all Bitcoin mined, what happens? Uh, well, it's like uh, once all gold is digged out of the ground, what happens? Uh, basically, uh, we have to deal with what we have. So um, at that point, uh, there won't be uh, new Bitcoins being produced, but um, there will be, um, you know, Bitcoin will still be there and it will still be uh, traded. Okay, so who really owns the rights to an NFT asset? The buyer, the creator, or the blockchain? Uh, well, it, it depends very much, of course, who uh, how the contract in the NFT is uh, shaped. Because in the end, the NFT is, um, is basically a digital contract, a contract on the chain. But typically, it's the buyer. So usually when you build an NFT, let's say you design or you create some, some digital picture and you attach an, an NFT, so a contract to that, and somebody buys that for a certain price, then with, in, in, with buying this NFT, the ownership of this picture is being transferred to, to whoever buy, buys the NFT. There is NFTs that are very interesting that provide, for instance, the uh, the creator of the NFT a small part of of the revenue. So, for instance, there is NFTs which say, and let's say, a, a painter paints a digital picture or a picture uh, attaches an NFT, and the, this this contract can be shaped the way that with every transaction, so every time when somebody new buys this NFT, a small portion of the buying price close to the creator, which I think is a very interesting way to um, to um, acknowledge the, the creation of um, of uh, the art. And then, yes, Lightning Speech, thank you very much. Thank you very much for being there. I think we are at the end of, well, I think we are at the end of the, uh, and we have access at the presentation video. Yes, um, we will be putting the video, I think on YouTube, uh, if I'm not wrong, we will uh, share the link to that on our webpage of digital, on digital leadership. And you can all expect uh, to, have to a link to the video so you can look once again. So thank you very much, all of you. Uh, it's a new experience for myself too. Um, I hope it was a good one for you and hoping to see you at the next webinar. Thank you very much.